Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Lloyd Fox, and I'm really pleased that I've been given this opportunity um, to talk to you in the 20th Prize Lecture of the EPS about early development in the context of poverty, uh, and in particular how um, I have used neurocognitive measures to begin to understand how we can tackle the consequences of poverty. Um, if we take this quote from the Nobel laureate Amitar Sen from um, some time ago, um, he spoke about the fact that poverty must be seen as deprivation of basic human capabilities, which then limits the freedoms to achieve something rather than merely a lowness of income. Um, when he spoke about this, it sort of changed a kind of um, a shift in thinking about conceiving poverty as a multidimensional phenomenon. Um, and this is particularly relevant within the 2030 agenda as the sustainable development goals launched in 2015, uh, requires countries to reduce poverty in all its forms and dimensions. Um, so understanding this in its entirety is, is key um, to um, trying to combat uh, the impact of poverty um, across the world. Uh, if we take um, some research has been gathering together information about child development across the world. Um, if you look at child development um, rep kind of milestones that we take um, in low and middle income countries only one in three children um, reach those um, basic developmental milestones um, and that impact is particularly strong in sub-saharan africa um, and i'm interested in this because conception to two years of age is a critical window of vulnerability to exposure to socioeconomic and health challenges and this is the area of um, psychology and neuroscience that my work is focused on really these first um, months and years of life um, and we, if we take this um, uh, time period these first a thousand days if you um, take this from conception as well and um, this really is a critical period for early brain development and um, with many aspects of our brain um, evolving and, and um, refining and specializing across these first two years uh, and within the context of that brain development, we might think about the conceptual model of child development as related to poverty. Um, and so if we think about this in terms of this figure, whereby that um, infant is developing um, in, across childhood, there'll be many factors that will influence that development, um, factors to do with the children themselves, the caregiving experience they receive, family factors such as finance, psychological resources, social resources, um, contextual factors such as um, neighbourhood stressors, neighbourhood impact um, and cultural factors. And across all of those, um, there can be, um, you can kind of think about some of these as protective factors and susceptibility factors that may indicate risk. Uh, and with all of this kind of risk that you might be exposed to in childhood, um, it has a cumulative effect. Um, and it will matter as to when um, these uh, risks or protective factors um, are within your uh, developmental trajectory in terms of the timing, the chronicity of it, so how long it lasts, the severity of that, of the particular episodes, how many there are, and how long those um, carry on impacting. Uh, and as shown by uh, a recent review of infant neuroimaging studies, um, if we think about the context of this developmental model um, in um, poverty, um, an issue arises in that the vast majority of research is still carried out in countries of the global north, um, and longitudinal study designs are still very much the exception of the norm in understanding early development. Um, the three key goals of my talk and the three um, areas that I really want to show that we've been working in the last few years um, are, are trying to address some of these um, issues. So firstly, I want to I demonstrate throughout this talk that we've been um, making big efforts to move research outside of the kind of Western industrialized rich lab um, as, as kind of coined by this weird phrase. Uh, we're also thinking about how to take developmental neuroscience into global health settings. And I hope to show the power of prospective longitudinal study designs that, that even begin during pregnancy and how this kind of study um, can really um, provide power to our findings and, and what we might be able to um, take from the research that we do. Um, 
thinking back then, one of the reasons um, why I began to think about looking at poverty um, is the particular area of research that I do is to refine neuroimaging techniques for use with very young babies. Uh, one of the reasons that we find a neuroimaging te techniques so helpful for early life is that it can be difficult to measure behavioural changes and often one has to wait until two to three years of age, for example, for a clinical diagnosis um, of a developmental disorder um, because you have to wait for sufficient behavioural um, kind of um, factors to uh, build up so that you're able to get this picture of an, a different developmental trajectory for that infant. Whereas neuromaging might offer a window into brain development in the first year of life. Um, one way in which I've looked at this in the past is to um, study the uh, impact of autism spectrum disorders. Um, so to look at infants that uh, have a brother or a sister with um, autism and see whether the way in which they respond to stimuli around them um, may differ earlier than the diagnosis that they would receive at three years of age. Um, and this uh, chart just captures one example of this. There's a lot of research in this area by many, many research groups. Um, in this particular case, um, we took FNEAS, which is a type of neuroimaging measure, um, to measure brain responses. And if you the take home message here really is that you can see that um, in a sample of infants that have a low family likelihood of, of developing autism, um, which is the green line, uh, you get this kind of activation response uh, when they're viewing this social stimuli. In those infants that had um, a family member that had autism and therefore were at higher risk of developing autis autism themselves, um, you see that those infants um, have a different type of response. Um, and so at, at just four to six months of age, we can see these differential brain responses that were linked to their uh, behavioral and clinical outcome later in life. And so this work with this technique, functional near infrared spectroscopy, which gives us this optical window into the body and allows us to measure um, these oxygen changes in response to activation in the brain, um, was um, seen by a group of researchers working in the Gambia. Uh, and they approached my colleague and I um, in 2020, 2020, 2012, uh, with the question, can we use FNEAS to measure brain development in infants who are undernourished in the Gambia? So to give you a bit of background about this research group, uh, they're based in a village called Kanaba in, in the West Kiang district of the Gambia. Um, this is a rural MRC field station that's been collecting surveillance data since the late Professor Sir Ian McGregor established this system in 1949. So it now forms a longitudinal demographic record of rural Africans spanning more than 70 years. It's one of the largest of its kind in the world. Um, at this um, site, this surveillance started because there are some key factors um, that make this population uh, very interesting to study um, and to understand the impact on their lives of, of living in these conditions, because they have a very stark um, pattern of seasonality where there's a stark variation of nutrients available across the course of the year. So they have a two distinct seasons, the dry season and then the rainy or hungry season when the food has been used up by the previous harvest. And, and because of this, the dietary composition and patterns of disease and the activity levels of the adults vary greatly um, because there's a need for very hard agricultural labor, especially for women, uh, for this, the subsistence farming that they do. Um, and as a, cons as a consequence, when you think about um, women who are pregnant, they end up having negative energy balance. Um, so, for example, their monthly weight gain will drop from 1500 grams a month to 400 during the hungry season. Um, and on top of these factors that influence the adult, the seasonal pattern um, affects disease as well, and it particularly impacts young infants and children. Um, so this seasonality in a way creates a natural experiment in which the month of birth acts as a strong proxy measure of fetal and early postnatal nutrition and of certain maternal and in infant infections and other ex environmental exposures. So together with the longitudinal demographic data that I just spoke about, it creates a model for exploring the impact of early life exposures on long-term health outcomes among, among rural Gambians. Um, and so this is the context in which we found ourselves um, starting to explore the impact of poverty. 
So the challenges that we faced initially um, were very practical in nature. So we were setting up neuroimaging research in a new environment that hadn't had it before. So we had to think about training those researchers um, to use this technique, to adapt the stimuli to the context that we're in, think about um, contextual factors such as the, the language being Mandinka predominantly in this area, but this is a non-written language. So all of the study information had to be verbally communicated. And because we hadn't collaborated with the group before, we were unsure you know, how many um, participants we'd be able to recruit per week, You know, what would we be able to do in our first uh, trip out there. Um, but as this, this kind of time graph shows in a way, I just want to highlight how easy it can be to take a neuroimaging measure to a global health setting. So it's not, it sounds like something that's kind of um, scary and complicated in a way to take technology out. Um, and this really does show how quickly we could get this done, granted with people that already knew what they were doing before training other people. So this is the kit um, on the Tuesday. Um, we took it in a, a Land Rover with field workers out to the village in Kenneba. You can see it's bumpy. We, you know, first of all, we didn't even know the equipment would survive being um, moved around like this. We'd always been so careful when we were moving them in labs. Um, then the next morning, we set up the equipment, um, as you can see on the table here. I uh, explained what we wanted to do to the field research that I'd be working with, Seiki Drame here. Um, and he suggested that we see if anyone wants to take part so that we can try it out. So he found a, a mother and baby who were happy to come in. Um, and as you can see, we very quickly uh, ran this study. Um, I think the first sort of functional brain imaging study in Africa of its kind. Um, and because everything was set up already and, and we were used to looking at this data, we were even able to um, extract those functional brain markers um, by the hour later when we were presented to the whole research group. Uh, and over the course of those two weeks, which actually uh, only reflects seven working days, we were able to test over 40 infants and complete a full study. Um, and over time during that first phase, uh, we gathered longitudinal um, data sets so that we could look at the brain responses to um, a social stimuli over time, as you can see, we gathered this um, on two subsequent visits and could see how this response changed over time, but also that it, it was localized to exactly the same area that we'd found these kind of responses in research in the past in the UK. Um, and so from that first uh, initial collaboration, several papers came out um, looking at, uh, at how we were first using the neuroimaging technique. Um, so we knew that it worked and we knew we could use it in the rural site. So this allowed us to get to our next phase of research and begin this. Um, and so the team expanded enormously with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We were able to set up a much larger scale longitudinal study um, with, uh, as you can see, many research collaborators in the Gambia and the UK, as well as many students that have contributed to the research over the past few years. Um, and this is the study that was developed. It's called the Brain Imaging for Global Health Study. Uh, and we had three sort of overarching aims to begin with. Firstly, to characterize typical and atypical developmental trajectories. So we didn't really have anything to go on. Um, we didn't have um, a whole lot of uh, brain imaging data for, from any other studies in the past. So this had been rarely looked at under two years. And um, so we knew that we needed to just understand the context um, of how brain development was affected early on in life in, in this setting. Um, we also wanted to understand the impact of early life risk factors of adversity on these developmental trajectories. Uh, and importantly, we wanted to train and support the local staff rather than going in and collecting data and just taking everything away. So that was a big aim for us as well. Um, and so we recruited families in pregnancy and then we followed them from birth until two years. And uh, this year, we're also following them at three to five years for a preschool assessment called Bright Kids. Um, so we were really motivated to understand the impact of these multiple poverty associated and population specific factors. So rather than the initial study that was very small, um, what we wanted to do is sort of think about the context we were in much more. Um, so in, in addition to the nutritional factors that I spoke about and the seasonality factors, um, the society in this rural location of the Gambia often follow a polygamous um, and multi-generational family structure. Um, so the average household's around 17, but it can actually range from just two or three up to 150 plus. 
um, all living in, within one um, kind of compound complex. Um, the majority of the population live below the poverty line and earn less than $2 a day. Um, and so um, in amongst all of these, we know that there are many factors, biological, psychosocial and poverty associated. And, and what we want to try and untangle is which of these factors could be adverse to the infant's development, which could be protective, which could be beneficial. Um, so the backbone of the study was about understanding the brain. Um, so we had many um, paradigms for measuring the brain using FNEAS and EG. And we followed these infants across these time periods. So there's eight time periods of um, assessment. Um, but we cannot just measure brain you know, in isolation. We need to contextualize our findings. Um, so it was a balancing act of subjective observation um, to address and assess the contextual validity and objective standardization of methods to address the research question. So by documenting as many pre and postnatal markers and variables as we could, we hoped to then be able to generate a cumulative model of impact on the development, identifying those most at risk and those uh, with protective beneficial markers. And so the whole study has a lot more measures than just the brain. Um, we measure um, home environment, we measure uh, family demographics, medical history, we measure growth, biological factors, um, parent-infant interactions, uh, mental health, and many uh, cognitive and developmental measures as well. Um, and the, at the moment, this has um, led to several outputs, as you can see here, including four PhD theses since 2015. Um, and for the remainder of the talk, I want to take some of those findings, um, some from those papers, some from work that um, colleagues are doing in the Bright study right now. Um, so just be aware, please, that these slides contain confidential data, which we want to share with you, but please don't re redistribute without our permission. So firstly, let's think about population specific factors. So we're trying to make sure we're measuring these. Um, and it's really important for us to do this because we need to observe the culture and population that we're working with. We need to understand the community that are collaborating with us. Um, and so we've gone through several um, uh, kind of processes in order to make sure this study is valid. Um, we've had some some opportunities for the community to tell us what's important. So listening circles where we've um, talked about infant development, talked about um, things that we plan to do and find out their feedback. Um, we're trying to include people in this process of science and not just when we have the results so that we can kind of empower them uh, for citizen science in what's happening in their community. And we also want to ensure that the study, the, the team, sorry, of the study researchers share the same values, culture and language. So you, you may have noticed on the, the, the slide a few back that many of the researchers undertaking this um, research with us, um, or the majority of them in the Gambia, are from the Gambia, are from the community, many of them as well. Um, and, and so they are leading this research um, in that area. So let's think about some of these community focus groups just to give you an example of how we have been working with the community. Um, so uh, one way to give you an example of how we need to understand the impact of the culture and the population that we're with is if you think about newborn behavior, um, we know that infants early behavior may influence the kind of caregiving that they receive. And also that the caregiving practices that they receive themselves may incite differences in their own behavior. Um, and one example of this using a neonatal assessment when the infants are just two days old um, in the 1970s in Kenya showed that at two days of life, motor maturity was higher in Gusi infants um, than American infants. Um, just thus showing how quickly um, uh, impact can happen. And so one of the focus groups that was run by a PhD student, Christine Bartram, and Fabakri and Tijan, um, who are research workers in the Gambia, uh, was to um, bring, uh, bring community members to sessions where they could observe this neonatal assessment and tell us what they thought about it um, and use it as a platform to talk about um, infant development and tell us their um, ideas and thoughts on what they thought their own infant or other infants around them were capable of. So fathers, mothers and elders from three different villages came and watched some of these sessions. Um, 
And the outcomes of those sessions were that we were able to think about practical adaptation. So um, the fact that the um, homes that we're going into uh, don't have tables or very rarely, um, that they often have light, low level of light because there's no electricity. Um, the floor can sometimes be une unclean if it's a mud floor. So these kind of adaptations just allowed us to work out how we would do this assessment in that context. Um, it really highlighted the importance of the assessor and observer collaboration, that is the field researcher and the parent in just talking through what they were doing with a baby that young. Um, and it demonstrated to us that the knowledge of core aspects of infant development was very similar to the UK. So if we're thinking about their understanding of, um, for example, infants' um, visual abilities and um, hearing abilities um, from the first days of life, um, we could see that parents that were around infants were saying um, the very thing that we would, and perhaps the people that would talk about some abilities as being a bit later uh, were the el elder members of the community, which is um, very similar to people that I hear in, in the UK in terms of some, what we would call wives tales about um, what infants are uh, capable of. Um, so let me just give you an example then of how we're starting to use this data. So um, the MBAS that was measuring abilities of the new the neonate when they're first born, so within the within the first seven to 14 days of life, um, have been um, compared with the behaviour that those infants elicit during parent-infant interactions um, when they're one month of age. And this graph just shows one um, area that we've been looking at um, in that um, a relationship has been uh, found between the neonatal social orientation that they show when they're seven to 14 days um, and their attentiveness and communication at one month of age. Um, so if we move forwards uh, beyond that newborn phase, we're also trying to gather information about family caregiving practices and the environment that the infants are living in. Um, so if we think about some of the uh, questions that we've undertaken, um, we understand at 12 months of age that the caregivers that the infants have are a wide network. In addition to the parents, many do activities with their siblings, grandmothers and aunts, as well as other caregivers. And certainly the proportion of um, time they spend with their fathers is a, a lot lower um, than uh, what we would find in the UK. And in terms of the activities undertaken, the infants and the gamma are engaging in a variety of activities with caregivers, such as playing, singing songs and going outside. Um, if we take now one area that we've been exploring within the home, when they're 12 months and then 18 and 24 months, uh, the infants wear a leaner device which is a language environment recorder that allows us to measure um, all of the sounds that the infant um, has around them, as well as the sounds that they produce over a two day period at each age point. Um, and what we found uh, uh, in the first set of data that we've looked at, so this isn't complete, but it's, it's the um, first third of the data, um, is that the number of adult child conversations that the infant has at 18 months that were recorded associates with the number of words spoken by the child at 24 months of age. Um, and that's over and above any conversations that they're having at that time point as well, or the, or the number of words that they had at an earlier time. So we can see this link between um, the conversations that are occurring in their environment and then how much um, kind of that uh, supports um, them to develop their own language six months later. So what further considerations um, you know, are we thinking about currently? So uh, which kin matters is one that comes up often in the context of this um, uh, study. Uh, we know that as humans, we have multiple dependents that we have to care for simultaneously, and that this childcare is often provided by the mothers, but we have limits, so we can't do um, everything as parents. We have to um, trade off um, energy um, and face you know, um, time constraints. Um, and we know in the Gambian context that mothers are also primary, the primary farmers in this population. So there will be seasonal impacts on caregiving, depending on whether they're in the period of the year when farming is very intense versus a little bit slower. Um, and as I've just talked about here, we know that allo maternal care is common. And so the infant often has multiple caregivers. Um, and we've been uh, thinking about this through um, talking to researchers in uh, uh, Tanzania, who investigated the impact of this type of care on child health um, and are currently looking at um, 
relationships between the different types of caregivers and, and uh, measures of child development. Um, and we know in the Gambia that mothers sometimes live with the parent, their parents still, sometimes they've moved in with the father and their family compound. You know, do, do any of these have an impact on who's caregiving the infant and uh, in a positive or negative way? Um, and what about the neighborhood itself? So uh, research um, has shown that neighborhood poverty can increase the allostatic load, but there will be buffering effects if that, those families are strong and extended. Now, as I've just described in the Gambia, they often follow a polygamous family uh, structure uh, with multiple generations. So there's going to be a, a large amount of um, extended family support in theory. Um, and so, you know, what does that mean? That, that's something that we uh, want to explore as well. So turning now to thinking about some of the measures we're taking, um, measuring um, in relation to early cognitive development and thinking about some of these growth markers. Um, so the, um, the motor and cognitive development of the infants is something that we have been measuring uh, from five months up to 24 months of age uh, using the Mullins scales of early learning, uh, where we can um, do various tasks with the infant at a table or on the floor um, and, and measure uh, their general development in, in several areas, language, visual attention, gross, fine motor skills. Um, what we've seen in the data that we've been collecting here is that there tends to be a decline and stabilization in cognitive performance. So the Gambian infants show um, a decline from five to 12 months and no further changes um, after 18 months. Although we must always note that um, this is relative to US norms in how we're describing these. So this is one area that um, global health research is very um, mindful of is that you can compare to a norm in order to compare to another country, then that norm might not be appropriate. So you could use raw scores within the country and look at individual variability within that context. But then conversely, you have this challenge of then comparing this to other um, countries. So for now, we tend to take the raw score while we're looking within this population. Um, but there are always caveats here as to how you um, measure uh, their development overall. Um, but we have started to use these factors to think about how they relate to other measures we're taking. So um, Basilica is very interested here in looking at maternal factors in pregnancy and early postnatal life. Um, and one area that she's been looking at is how uh, the interactions that we see during these parent-infant sessions um, relate to the uh, Mullins scores. Um, and here I'm just showing um, some of this data to see that the maternal sensitivity that, um, uh, that they show during the one month interactions predict better gross motor skills at 18 months. Conversely, if the depressive behaviors are higher um, during that interaction, we note uh, that the poorer skills seem to develop um, by the time they're 18 months of age. Um, and we're trying to kind of understand um, these relationships in the context of other factors, of course, as I said to you, it's multidimensional. Um, so one area where there seems to be an earlier connection linking onwards and what we need to try and work out is causality and how these do interrelate. Um, but we have also seen that there's an association between antenatal maternal self-reported depression and examiner rated depressive papers during the play interactions. So those that were showing those higher scores at one month of age that, that we were scoring the videos from um, have also said that they were suffering from higher depressive symptoms during pregnancy. Um, so Sam McCann, a, a postdoctoral researcher um, who's been a PhD student in Bright and looking at this um, data from the perspective of the nutritional information and the growth information that um, we've been gathering. Um, here's some kind of um, uh, highlights from the work that she's been doing in the last couple of years. So she's been looking at individual linear growth curves um, and using mixed effect modeling to compare these to other factors that we're measuring. And, the first take home from this is that she can see by measuring stunting that infants were most likely to become stunted between 0 to 1 months of age and males were twice as likely as females to be stunted by 18 months. Um, looking at those infants that were undernourished, she sees that it, infants in the 
bottom quartile of their Mullen scores overall when they reach 18 months were consistently shorter from six months onwards. So their growth was already faltering and the, that um, was associated later with their Mullen scores. But interestingly, there seems to be some six sex differences here. So males were much more vulnerable to linear growth faulting and the associated cognitive con consequences. Um, so this relationship um, was only evident for boys when you um, compared their uh, length for age and their scores 18 months of age. Okay, so that's some of the backgrounds about the development and growth that we're looking at. Now I want to turn to you thinking about how we've been creating developmental trajectories of brain function and neurocognition. So um, I've given you, I hope, a flavour of all of these contextual factors that we're measuring in the Bright study, and now turn to having a look at um, our understanding of brain function in this longitudinal format. So one such paradigm that we're using um, is interested in understanding um, measures of habituation and novelty detection. These are two core processes of neurodevelopment that are important in early life, well, in, in, in life uh, throughout our lifespan, actually, um, because what we want to be able to do is, is suppress a response to repeated sensory input that's the same um, and increase those responses when we um, when we have novel stimuli around us. So this serves as a really efficient means of attention allocation and it helps us direct early learning. So it could potentially be a useful early biomarker of cognitive function. So one of the ways we measure this, because we have several in the Bright study, is to use um, the NEARS technique to look at brain activation. Uh, during this task, the infants hear repeating sentences over and over again um, in Mandinka, uh, in Gambia, um, that will repeat 15 times with the same speaker, the same sentence. And then during the novelty phase, that speaker will switch to someone else, and then it will return back to the um, familiar speaker at the end. And when we look at these developmental trajectories to 18 months of age, um, we can see uh, that in five to 12 months of age, the Gambian infants tend to habituate at a slower rate than what we have seen in, in the UK cohort that we have. Um, so they will actually continue to habituate across the trials containing the novel sounds and, and don't at a group level demonstrate a response to the novelty. But that response to novelty, which mimics more closely the pattern that we see in the UK, um, will start to emerge at the group level from 18 to 24 months. Um, and when we uh, think about this construct, we're also looking at it in an EEG task as well. Um, so uh, if we think about this um, in an auditory oddball task, which is being take, undertaken with EEG, so instead of um, sentences, these are very short tones um, where we're looking at the infant's ability to um, understand changes in frequency or, or novel um, sounds, um, which is a developmental marker that we've um, seen in other research groups, in other research studies, um, that shows this switch between one and five months of age in, in uh, cohorts that have been studied in Europe, uh, whereby they will start to um, elicit a stronger response to the novel um, a sound that they hear by five months of age. Um, but actually in the Gambian cohort, when they've been looking um, at this date, when Laura's been looking at this data, um, the kind of switch to novelty, um, this um, response um, that I spoke of, doesn't occur until 18 months of age. Um, now, we have a bit of a, a window here where we don't actually measure EEG um, beyond five months, so we don't know when in which that switch occurs, but it's strikingly similar to the NEARS data that we're seeing, which did um, measure at eight and 12 months as well and didn't find a group effect. Um, and what's interesting as well with this data um, is when we look at the EEG and the NEARS data in terms of their habituation response, um, we see that the highest individual variability it seems to be seen at five months of age. Um, and so within that sample, um, we can see infants that do respond to novelty and some that don't. And I'll come back to this um, as you see uh, the next few slides. So um, in particular, we're really interested in how early we can see um, these differences. Uh, in a second set of um, data that we, we have from the Bright um, 
paradigms with NEARS, we're collecting uh, samples of functional connectivity. Um, and the reason that we're interested in this is it's related to myelination and synaptogenesis, which are fundamental for neurodevelopmental processes. So there's evidence of a shift um, between local short range connectivity, which is usually intrahemispheric, which means within one hemisphere, left or right. Um, and during developments, we um, switch to having more mature long range connectivity, which then is usually interhemispheric from left to right or frontal posterior. Um, so this is kind of a developmental switch that has been shown in many different studies. Um, and Chiara and Adam have been um, analyzing the data that has been collected by the group um, in the Gambian sample. And looking at that data from five to 24 months of age while infants watch calming videos for around five minutes. Um, and this longitudinal development has thrown up some predicted responses and some surprises that I will discuss here. So in the linear mixed modeling of um, these infants that have data at all of these time points, um, we can see that functional connectivity significantly increases with age in many areas, just as we predicted. 75% of these are intrahemispheric and especially within the temporal lobes, as well as some interhemispheric. Um, but something that has caused us some surprise is that we also see functional connectivity that significantly decreases with age. And 70% of those are interhemispheric, and especially within the frontal cortex, which are these channels on this figure um, that are above the dotted line. Um, and you can understand our surprise when you think about the background of uh, research that we rely on for this data in that it's inconsistent with what's been shown so far in infants from high resource settings. Um, so previous studies have shown that functional connectivity increases with age, as I said, that it increases in hemispherically, um, and also that there is a rapid and constant expansion of the frontal cortex and its functional connectivity during development. So instead, at group level, we are finding a pattern that looks um, in the other direction. So we're currently trying to understand what this might mean in terms of this sample. Um, there have been some exploratory analyses done by Chiara. Um, I can speak about some of those here, but they really are preliminary um, and we need to kind of watch this space for more. But just to give you a, a, a flavor of some of the things that we are looking at in association with this, um, one area that she's seen is that if you look at this interhemispheric functional connectivity in the frontal cortex at five months of age, so again, this younger age point, she sees that this associates with better mullein performance at 18 months. So those infants that have high interhemispheric connectivity very early on seem to be showing this better um, performance later on at 18 months. Okay, so the final task here that I want to speak about before um, bringing all this together is an eye tracking task. So it's a neurocognitive task that looks at tension shifting. Um, and this is looking at the infant's ability uh, when they watch this screen to shift their attention from uh, a stimulus on the left or right uh, to a middle stimuli. Sometimes these stimuli occur at the same time, sometimes there's a gap, and uh, it's much easier to switch your attention when you don't have competing stimuli. So we can look at this overlapping condition um, and understand their attention shifting. Um, and what has been found by um, Luke and Sam so far is that at five months of age, Gambian infants are somewhat slower to shift attention than the patterns that we've seen before in the UK and in our cohort here. Um, and this speed deficit increases by eight months and maintains throughout 12 and 18 months of age. By 24 months of age, the Gambian infants have largely caught up. Um, so we're currently considering what this might mean that um, if we think about the fact that it's suggesting that Gambian and UK infants remain different for the first one to one and a half years of life at the group level. And what are the consequences of this if you are shifting attention more slowly in this kind of middle infancy period, how does this relate to the adversity risk factors that we have um, and what does this imply um, for outcome? Um, and so some of this data has begun to be explored in connection with other data sets in Bright. Um, and what has been found is that infants in the bottom quartile for disengagement time, so those that are um, the, the worst performers at five months, achieve lower Mullen scores at eight and 12 months of age although interesting, not by 18 months. 
Furthermore, at the group level, females seem to outperform males in their ability to shift attention to new stimulus. So another area that we found um, uh, a sex difference in performance. So in the final section of the talk, I want to um, sort of bring up the kind of key areas that I think um, are important in global health research and the key areas that I'm interested in thinking about in the context of poverty, whether in, in low income countries or um, in the UK. Um, so firstly, I think my first point to myself is that I should be open about what I don't know and the questions that I have. Um, and so if we think about the data that I've just shown you there, um, I believe overall we're starting to shine a light on the importance of studying longitudinally and particularly within the first six months of postnatal life. So quite a lot of the um, findings that we have are suggesting how important it is that we've measured this early on in life so that we can look at how that relates over time in trajectories and outcome. Um, I ask myself the question all the time in this research, are we getting beyond just rating the child's ability and understanding what we're asking them to do? Um, so not just that they've never played with a toy or a book before in the Mullen, for example, and we're asking them to read a book. So, you know, we need to kind of make sure that we're asking relevant questions. And are we actually beginning to uncover a child's individual developmental stage and trajectory? And do our findings tell us anything important for this population? So what does a response at a particular age mean? Um, you know, why are we seeing these responses um, that seem to be coming out early on? What does it mean if some responses even out to 18 months? Um, really, to me, that just means it's even more important to continue to monitor them longitudinally and find out what's happening at a later age. So we, we shouldn't take development as a linear um, trajectory. We need to understand the, how this um, changes over the time. So this kind of, um, you know, it, this concept of having a kind of platted um, response that might oscillate according to other factors that we're measuring. Um, and one such example of something that we don't understand right now, but we're actively exploring is um, what do the sex differences mean? Um, so we know that boys um, are more impacted by uh, uh, undernutrition than girls. So the way in which their body grows requires more nutrition more nutrients, sorry, early in life. And so they can be impacted on, on, on their physical development earlier on. Um, that these kind of differences in other areas that we're looking at now are, are new in, in this research group and we're trying to think about what that might mean. Um, and importantly for us, for, for the um, kind of immediate term, how are these responses that we've seen in naught to two years going to map onto the preschool measures, this kind of preschool outcome time point that we have at three to five years. Um, and this is important because this is the time point that lots of people in global health use as a kind of starting point or as a measure of ability. So this preschool um, executive function age, um, finding out you know, their, their abilities just before they enter school is, uh, is an area where we can compare to lots of other data sets now that we have data at that time point. So secondly, I would say um, that we need to think about the challenges of interpreting multiple data sets. Um, so we're continuing to try and understand the strengths and limitations of our data, um, and we're actively integrating data into higher level analyses. So we've got structural equation modeling underway to investigate some of the relationships, such as the one I've just given an example of here, which would try and determine the direct and indirect relationships between growth, nutrition and early development in the context here of the developing social brain and social brain regions. My point three would be, do we have a new risk factor that we have to consider? So um, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic is widening the gap between those who are rich and those who are poor. Um, as a research group in Cambridge, um, I'm leading a study with Mark Johnson at, um, at the Baby Lab to understand the impact of the pandemic on um, parents and infants in the UK. Um, the Coco Pit study will is um, an online study trying to understand those impacts and some of the very early data that we have that we are currently um, writing up um, would suggest uh, not only that there are impacts on the parents themselves, but also that we might see an impact on infant development going forward. 
Um, so, um, you know, this is just giving you an example of the fact, as, as, as some, a lot of us know, that the way that the baby was interacting with people other than their direct caregivers changed hugely in different versions of lockdowns. Um, and some data here is showing us that babies born in different time points across the last um, 18 months in the UK um, may uh, be impacted differentially in terms of how responsive they are to sounds and sights. Um, and so uh, this is something that we're continuing to explore. And we've integrated some COVID questions in the BRIGHT study, but found actually that those were not necessary in the context of that particular global health project, um, because COVID hasn't become a huge factor, thank goodness, so far um, in that context. Um, so while we tried to implement similar questions, um, they were found to be ineffective in that particular population. Number four, I think is a, um, a, an area that we talk about a lot <laughs> in our own research group and with other people who are, are really interested in trying to um, think about how we build capacity uh, for local expertise. So um, it's just really important to be mindful of the fact that we are having a difference right now in the site of data collection and the site of analysis. So most expert users are in the high income countries and the data tends to be sent back to them, i.e. us in the UK, rather than being analyzed um, in the Gambia. Um, and until this year, for example, in the Gambia, um, they had just um, initiated a psychology degree at to university for the first time in the Gambia. And so we hope to form collaborations with students there to try um, and um, start to um, form relationships with um, uh, researchers of the future that would, would be interested in working with us in this um, data. But you know, some of this has been challenging. And some of the ways that we talk about this is thinking about um, keeping that expertise in the Gambia that these uh, uh, amazing people that we work with have by generating training hubs and local networks within sub-Saharan or West, West Africa where they could transfer their expertise to other new users, particularly in the neuroimaging and cognitive development measures. The fifth point I'd like to address is that while I spoke about some practical issues that we overcame when we first arrived, there are still many that we need to take into account when thinking about using um, neuroimaging in particular um, in such context. So there are going to be country specific conditions. Some babies, um, when they're born, say in intensive care, have to share a bed two, two or three at a time. So how do you use this um, technology in that context? Um, the equipment's often sourced from a different country. So if you think about the fact in the Bright Project, for example, in the peak use, um, our research study was testing four infants a day for seven days a week in a rolling um, weekly um, layout for two years in a row. So there was no room for something to break in a sense. We had to be really careful of this. And of course it's more challenging if it breaks and you have to go back to a country somewhere else to get the, the equipment to replace it. Um, Instrumentation you know, can be challenging um, to transport. Um, we've demonstrated it's not too bad in the context of the Gambia, but you know, other kinds of global health studies, this would be a huge factor if it needs to be more transportable. Um, and transferring large volumes of data across sites is something that we can't get um, shy away from. It's something really important that we need to think about as a practical issue. So the importance of local backups, intermediate and long-term data storage. Um, so, um, point six here just brings um, up some of the future innovations or current innovations, I think, that are happening, um, which will help us reach hard to reach communities, um, such as in the Gambia, but also um, in the context of this study here that I'm uh, running um, in Cambridge with Mark Johnson. The Pitkin um, study is designed, um, one of the key goals is to get that to technology and that research practice and study to go into the home so that I'm able to access participants that are living in low resource settings and participants that do not normally choose to partake in research. So by um, innovations in technology that have occurred in the last couple of years, we're now able to do that. We have wearable technology and the, the NEARS and the EEG that they can use in the home. And um, so um, we're really excited about getting this off the ground when COVID restrictions allow. Um, and 
that brings me to the point of the power of neuroimaging. So I think I'm hoping I've demonstrated that um, by using these neuroimaging tools, we have begun to elucidate some early markers that we would otherwise not have been able to see with behavioral changes um, within the first six months of life. Um, but other kind of, you know, advantages of uh, using these technologies as well that, that brought us there to begin with is that we know that this tool is subjective. It can be used in the same way across different research and clinical teams. We can standardize these paradigms and make sure they're very short. So 10 minutes plus per paradigm um, is much shorter than behavioral tasks that we take. Um, and um, with that in mind, we can begin to task share, data share across other sites in, in the world, um, which we are doing. Um, and this will allow us to kind of um, develop better modeling and statistical approaches and to understand um, when we sort of tackle um, questions that we have from different directions by thinking about them in different contexts, we will understand our data better. Um, and that can never happen um, and must happen in so it never can, it must happen in the context of a multidisciplinary project team. So we need to be able to understand risk factors from multiple directions and we need expertise that are wide ranging. So that's the beauty of networking um, with other researchers. Um, and uh, with that in mind, this is one example of how um, uh, since the first study that we did in the Gambia in 2013, a multidisciplinary network has been established to think about um, the use of FNEs in global settings, um, uh, as you can see uh, in this figure. Um, so it's now kind of shifting down um, from this kind of global north site um, into uh, South America and Africa, um, Bangladesh, India, and other areas um, of lower income countries. Finally, um, my, uh, the final area that, you know, I, I'm excited about getting towards and, you know, part of the research programme of the next years for myself and our, my colleagues is thinking about how we can help with interventions to tackle the consequence of poverty. Um, but there can be an, an assumption that some types of intervention will apply as positive across different contexts, as, as Helen Peen um, spoke about in her perspectives on poverty um, uh, from a neuroscientific point of view. So um, we must be aware when we're thinking about these interventions um, to, to think about population specific factors, what might be particular challenges and benefits in particular environments. And I think some of the um, talks in um, uh, the beautiful talks in the in the global symposium earlier in the day have demonstrated some of the areas that this is um, happening. Um, and to just think about this from the context of the Gambia, uh, uh, my colleague Sophie Moore um, is uh, running uh, an efficacy trial called Indigo to think about the nutritional supplementations um, that they believe are essential in the first six months of life. Um, so historically interventions um, quite often give micronutrients once the infant is weaned and presumes that breast milk um, is sufficient. And part of um, Sophie's drive is to um, show that these uh, micronutrients in the context of the gamma are essential during breastfeeding as well. Um, so that's one area that's um, already underway in the Gambia and has started this year. Um, another area of intervention that has been used, for example, in the Jamaica Early Childhood Stimulation Intervention is to think about parent-mediated interventions. Um, and this study continues to show impact. A recent um, publication um, this year showed an impact on income and education in those um, children uh, when they reach 30 years of age. Um, so what does this mean in the context of rural Gambian families? We need to think about this while... Um, gathering this data in Bright, so understand if any parent-mediated intervention could be beneficial and, and in what form would that take? Because we are understanding at the moment um, what interactions those infants have in, the fact they have multiple caregivers. I mean, what kind of, um, what kind of concept would that have in this, in this site? We are definitely um, talking about and hope to integrate into nutritional um, interventions as well in the future. Um, so 
in with that context in mind my my final kind of point about these interventions is is i hope that we have shown that measuring the brain can help us reveal processes underlying poverty impacts that might not otherwise be observable at the time of intervention and they will allow us to discover when the timing of the intervention will affect most change rather than waiting several years um, to see that impact perhaps measuring the brain will allow us to um, uh, direct and, and model that intervention um, in a more flexible way at the time. Um, so in, in all of what we do, um, I think this is a, a, a point well made by um, Banerjee and Dufflo in 2019 that, that we must always have in mind rethinking what we understand about poverty. So you know, as they say here, our goal is to make the fight against poverty based on scientific evidence. Um, but as they point out, often the poor are reduced to caricatures and even people who try to help do not understand how to break down problems into smaller questions. And I think fundamentally, there are things that we don't understand and could characterize quite easily um, in the study of, of poverty, um, myself included, uh, which is why I hope I've um, convinced you in this, the, those previous slides of the importance of having this multidisciplinary, multi-site team um, with researchers that are integrated in the community um, that you are working with. Um, and so finally, I'd just like to acknowledge that by um, having a study of this size, when you increase the number of measures, um, it leads to an increase in responsibility to understand these, these, um, this data. Um, and this really wouldn't be possible without the huge level of support and collaboration we have with researchers in the Gambia and the UK. Um, the students and young scientists who bring fresh perspectives to our work each year, uh, the funders who obviously believe in the work that we do, and of course the families who allow us to enter their lives and share in their experiences. Um, so thank you so much for listening and I'd be happy to take questions.